And here we are on this side of the cage with the battering boys themselves, Mr. Ooh. Fence, Mr. Brinkman. What's going on, guys? Well, I'm awesome, man. How are you guys doing? How are you, Steve? I'm just happy to be here. Man. It's just happy to be here. Yeah, very happy to be here. Now I'm going to kick off the podcast. I got, I brought you a gift, then. Oh. Because I think people are always hitting you up for free gear. Oh. But I brought you some free gear. Oh, it's the rustliest. Oh, it's got to be terrible. Oh, yeah. <laughs> ASMR jiu <jitsu. laughs> Thank you very much, my friend. You're welcome, buddy. You Mediums that work for you? We'll find out. Yeah. Oh. So, that is uh, the Fence and Jiu-Jitsu Rash Guard. And my students voted on... Uh, what to put on it. And I always whinge about certain things that I dislike. And I really hate Wizards and Warlocks and Game of Thrones. And what is it? So they voted for a dragon and a man fighting him. Yeah. So that's actually, that's so it's actually quite good. It's got yeah, the rubber at the bottom and all that stuff. It's got the scale of the yeah. thing. That's really yeah. cool. No, thank you very much, my friend. So we've found some jujitsu dragons now. Are we getting submitted in this? Fantastic. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I thought it'd be good branding, not bad branding. <laughs> We're not learning, isn't it? It's all, it's all part of the same. <laughs> You're getting tapped out in my logo. Can't have At least that. it works. <laughs> Sustainable. That doesn't make you 10% better at jiu-jitsu, that. And proven. It's, and it's purple for you there, Dan. I'm Fisticuff shorts help for, you know, striking jiu-jitsu. And whoever <laughs> wins, really, like, you know, so far we've got a couple of wins in that. You know, it counts up stats building. Yeah. And um, I give a shout out to Luda's Fightwear. They make them. They're very good. So if you want a custom rash guard, hit them up. Ludusfightwear.co.uk. Yeah. Fantastic. I'm just going to go through Valor, but maybe I'll have to look them up now. No, he's good because he can design it for you and stuff. Oh, nice. Yeah, full, full print. That does and look did look the cool. rubber bomb. Got to love the rubber oh. bomb. Oh. Yeah, I don't, I don't like the... Uh, the riding. Uh, this fella. Unfortunately, I don't think he's going to win. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, stranger things have happened. No. <laughs> looks so the design mean. looks good, but, you know, optimistically, he's not... Um, <laughs> 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 this is a GSP thing. Send who you want, not who you want back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is true. Right, before we kick off, I just want to say, because I don't want to forget later on, I want to let everyone know, it's September 10th, we've got a big charity event planned. This, I'm trying to make the biggest event in the history of UK Jiu-Jitsu. It might not happen, but try it. <laughs> so, I rented out the High Wycombe Judo Centre, it's a massive facility. Um, I've got 25 of the UK's best instructors all coming to teach, including Steve, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu Black Belt, and Kevin Roger, Raymond Paul, a bit of a legend in the South, uh, Dan Strauss, Jed Hugh, like names and names and names and names and names. Um, and like nearly all, yeah, 25 Black Belts are all gonna come and teach. And they're all giving out the time for free. Um, and it's all helping give money to charities uh, that support families with terminally ill kids. So you've got a terminally ill family member. One of the stresses is work because you want to spend as much time at home as you can, but you also need to make a living. So if we can alleviate that stress a little bit, it's great. So suggested donation is 20 quid. If you can't afford that, give what you can. Come along, you get two and a half hours of training. We we'll split you in little groups. So you'll be like a group of five white belts and every 15 minutes, 10 minutes, a new instructor will come along and teach you whatever you want to learn or their speciality. And then it means it can be tailored to your level as well. So you've got, like you, so you know, a group of experienced guys that know what they're doing. You can have more specific instruction and uh, help you out. And that's it, really. So it's the 10th of September, midday. Uh, and if you want to find out details, just follow me at Chris Fenson, BGJ on Instagram. That's or fantastic. Or you, because I get you to share it. Oh, I could plug in that. That's fantastic. As <laughs> hopefully, you better be there as well. Oh, definitely. Yes. I mean, the model of that I really like because that sort of you're gaining something from supporting it as well, you're understanding what's going on in that community giving back as well yeah. and appreciating that place where it comes from. Again, personal family things, similar sort of situations where you've had to take the time away from your work and other responsibilities to really prioritize what's truly important yeah. at that moment in time. Being able to provide that and create that from jiu-jitsu as well is Yeah, and then, like, and then also like with the jiu-jitsu thing, you, you guys know it's a slightly political martial art where yeah, people <laughs> shit on each other and all that stuff. And the idea of getting everyone together and just being like, we all love the same thing. Let's all train together, get on, and then help out other people with it. It's like, I think it's a good idea. And then immediately leave and shit on each other again on social media. Yeah, you're like, that that's how it works. It's terrible. Yeah. I can't that's believe it's all that. <laughs> you tried to teach me, that didn't really work. <laughs> it's just slagging off. My cult's better than your cult. <laughs> <laughs> it is a bit like that. <laughs> <laughs> My cult leader's got nicer rash guards, the dragon's on it. <laughs> so yeah, 10th of September, put it in your diaries, come along, like the, the venue can hold like 300 people. Mm. The new Cleos like, there, it's a good, um, good spot. Yeah, I'd like to get near those numbers. If it's 50 people and it's a great day, that's still awesome. But if we can, if we can max it out and it's the biggest non-competition event ever, that, that's the goal. And uh, I've, I've 
obviously you've got to pay for like venue and there's like overheads and stuff. Mm -hmm. I've done all of that out of my own pocket. So 100% of the money is going to charity. That's fantastic. As I say, when it comes to that, we'll speak as well a bit in more detail, probably about maybe some live stream stuff, some bits and bobs to sort of top that up to make yeah, sure it's more great. viable. But that'd be fantastic. Yeah, you're better at uh, marketing than that. You can help me out. <laughs> no, <laughs> I know, I know marketing words. Implementing the marketing <laughs> side of it, that's hard work. But saying things, it's just like managing. You just say things, people do it. Just square box <laughs> thinking. And... <laughs> I don't know no, not mean. this box. Outside. <laughs> oh, okay. Paradigm breaking. Paradigm breaking. Paradigm shifting. <laughs> Right, um, let's start talking fighting. Come oh on. yeah, the fighting yeah, thing. Yeah, let's talk Paul McManus. <laughs> the, guy, <laughs> the main man. He's running the interview now is what he's trying to do. Yeah, I, I, I was throwing it back at you. What's the rematch? McManus, yeah. come on. I mean... I think he wants you. I tell you what I was <laughs> furious with is that one of my teammates was matched with him. No problem. But at 70 kilo, I, had like, I got down to 66 to fight that man. Yeah. I am not 66 kilos. I was a skinny boy. I was a sad skinny boy. If I could have fought him at 70, I'd been a much happier day. <laughs> <laughs> I would have, you know, not been fainting on the scales. But either way, we move. I love Paul McManus. He's fighting again. He's just got a baby. He's like, Rick, he's got ricket legs. He's 110. It's just awesome, isn't he? Yeah. It's just a, and then what I love about him, the whole show, he'll wear his hand wraps. So after he fights, he'll sit in the crowd, but keep the hand wraps yeah. on. Just so you know. Everyone needs okay. to know. Now that brings me on to a really interesting point from you, Steve. What I saw on um on Instagram <laughs> was you put a post after I think it was All Stars. You didn't you took your medal off and you made a point saying that after the fact, you know, you go past your point of you've had your performance, now you move on. But as much as like you're laughing now, I think that's a really important point because much like myself and a lot of people, Steve is very humble. They, I they, they, <laughs> very humble. What is it? <laughs> no, no. I, I understand. I understand the sentiment, and we can get to the sentiment. But the real reason why I put up that post like that is because I was looking for like the nice picture of yourself on the podium that all your friends get. Uh, but obviously, all my friends like to take the piss, and they just caught me like kind of like <laughs> mid moan. And I have always, ever ever since uh, ever since I was in high school, I've always taken off my medal, um, pretty much as soon as they give it to me or like put it in my pocket. There's nothing like worse than you stop at the motorway services on the way home from like the Hereford mm -hmm. Open or a small comp. And there's like a table of guys all sat with their bronze medals on. <laughs> they fought bronzes. Like, oh, what are you doing? Take it off. What are you doing? Maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe to, to add some seriousness to it, it, it might get to the um, the emotion of, of victory, yeah. which is incredibly hollow. It's something that you mm. build up to for a very, very long period of time. And I remember spending um, my entire senior year at high school um, coveting a particular tournament, which is like we call it the um, the Offsa World Championship back home in, in Ontario where I'm from because because it's, we kind of treat it like a world championship. It's like the pinnacle of what you can do at high school. And most people just like burn out and fall off after that. And I'm definitely one of the ones that fell into that category. Um, but spending the entire year and then you win it and you're like, fuck. That was, was that? No, nothing happened, right? Yeah. Nobody, nobody just broke out into song and dance. There mm -hmm. wasn't any choreography. You know, I didn't get carried on anybody's shoulders. It wasn't like dun dun dun, roll credits. Didn't you have the same getting your jiu-jitsu black belt and your ballerina belt? It was like, it's like maybe a day where you kind of feel great and then it's like, so what? You always want the next thing, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like, yeah, there's, there's always It feels easy once you've achieved it almost, that's the sensation. It just felt like it's meant to be kind of thing. And, and the thing is, we also talk about like relief in terms of victory, relief in terms of defeat, but um, winning, you're just relieved that it all came together. And the biggest emotion that I have going into any sort of competition is just utter frustration. Yeah. I'm so frustrated that that person exists and they want to vie for whatever I want as well. <laughs> and I've had to, you talk about being a, a sad skinny boy. Well, I'm, I'm never skinny, but I'm always sad when it comes to not having food. Like, I, the one thing that I could never really control is my diet. Like, I, I can, but then I don't really want to. And, you know, the frustration I get from just, just going down to 76 kilos or something like that to go lightweight in a BJJ comp, it's just so frustrating. I'm just so annoyed. And when I look at that guy, you know, they're, they're warming up or whatever, and you're sitting, I'm just like, this was not fucking worth it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I go out there, put the pedal to the metal, and no matter what happens, it can go to decision and I can win by like an advantage, which I never do, by the way, I'll get to that later. Um, <laughs> or I can submit them really, really quickly and I'll just be disappointed. It'll be almost like we were talking about the guy before the podcast, the, the, the Viking fellow with the yeah. top knot who just looks disdainfully when you hit him in the face, right? It's like, this is all you have? Are you not entertained? <laughs> Did you not really bring it? Um, and it's because obviously in your mind it's very very big right? you've made it huge for a long yeah. period of time and then you realise it in reality and it's just 
reality. It's just a, it's mm. just a moment in time, and now that time is gone. It's some judo mats duct taped together in a sports center. It really Nobody is. cares. And little, you know, right. plastic medals if you're unlucky. It goes right? in a yeah, cupboard. Really right. nice ones. <laughs> and, you get, and maybe you get it to give it to your kids when you get in. They're like, oh my god, look, I got one, I got one. And then they fight over it. And, and then they're like, oh, then the winner keeps it. They fight for it. <laughs> 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 for it. <laughs> the little porn yeah, when Steve gets home. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the the All Stars belts are good to get the kids to fight over. Uh, Go on, good. kids. The winner gets fed. Losers. I mean, I compete a lot, and all my all my medals are in a carry bag in in the garage. I'm like, yeah. Don't care. It was like when me and my wife went to, back to Canada years ago, about five years ago, five years since uh, my wife and kids have been back to Canada, but I got like a shoe box and it's full of like wrestling medals, right? And I was very, very lucky because the, the school I was at, we um, we had a tournament every year and that tournament paid for our entry into other tournaments. So we got yeah. about 10 tournaments a year. Hmm. Um, so you have the chance to win 10, 10 medals a year. So in four or five years of high school, you can win loads and loads. Um, I had, you know, probably weighs a ton. You know, and I just, and I felt like, was like, oh yeah, you should bring it back home. You should bring it back home. I was like, ah. Uh, but we could, but we could, you know, we can get a bunch of cool Canadian clothes and maple yeah. syrup. You know, this thing probably weighs like five kilos. You know, that, that, that's not not worth the luggage. But saying that, when I started jujitsu, I wanted to win a medal. I was looking at mm. tournaments. Who was in my division? I was like, does any, does any fight four people? Mm. Just kind of, <laughs> I've got just, to be, just got to be one guy. Honestly, honestly, I still do that. I still do that. I was looking at my draw for the English Open. I was like, if I can just win one, I could get a medal. Win. I think it's why I won bronze for like my first three tournaments. Is because like as soon as I got to the point where I'd won a bronze, I was like. Yeah, I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> Checked well, out. Yeah. <laughs> like, I've already won. Once I got used to that, I was like, oh, gold would be better. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I did figure skating for ages when I was a kid, and I always... <laughs> <laughs> I explained the footwork. I, I need photos, Steve. Oh, I'll, I'll definitely. I need outfits. I'll get someone back on. I'll send me the photos. I'll them. send them to the battle crew. I'll, we'll get them up on the big screen. Always the best, <laughs> the best little posters and things. But I did it forever, and I went to like competitions and all sorts of things, and like. Battle are nice. Always. <laughs> it didn't matter how many people were in my group. I would always get silver. I'd never get gold. It's like a psychological thing. Always a bridesmaid. And I'd just be like, oh, well, silver is a nicer color anyway. But, but, um, oh, I really, I really like figure skating. It was quite, quite a lot of fun. It, it only came with the baggage of constantly, in, you know, in late nineties in Canada, just being called gay all the time, which at the time was really bad. But nowadays, it'd be really great. You know, I'm diverse, part of the LGBT plus community. You know, don't hit me with your hate speech. Remember my pronoun. <laughs> you know, right? So anyway, the first, the first bout I won on Battle Arena, James had ordered custom belts, with, like engravings and stuff, and. Uh, but they hadn't arrived in time for that sh- for the show, so they had one belt. So you won the belt. I won. I won the middleweight title, and they're like, Put "You hold the belt," and then they go, "Right, now you got to give it back because we've got to give that to everyone tonight, <laughs> so we can take photos." And I was like, "I don't want to give it back." It's <laughs> 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 only like two weeks for my belt to come in the so, post. So it's a bit of an anticlimax. <laughs> just the gold belt. I'm like, "What do I do that?" <laughs> Obviously, they'd evolved a little bit. I remember when me and Sam won our titles in 2011, I think it was, and here in Northampton, we had to share. Gloves. Yeah, yeah. So like we were warming up, and it's like I didn't have my glove back on on yet. And then the fight before me ended, and I put these warm, squishy gloves on. Like coming in someone else's blood and sweat and tears. Let's go. Yeah, do it up. Well, but this brings us on to Battle Arena, which we're talking about how they've improved so Mm. much and become gone from a small show where these schmucks could win. Even we could (laughs) win. (laughs) (laughs) We got in there early. It was very smart. uh, To now being like probably the UK's biggest show, or just about there. Especially the amount of events they put on, um, and like they've improved so much, and now there's no more sharing gloves. You've got cut team, properly produced videos, you know, good big events, and like suspect, ju- suspect ju- judging though because of Marty Wolf. Questionable, questionable. judging, yeah, questionable. questionable. Just because yeah, of Marty we'll let them off just for today. And if you'd like to see a battery in a bit, <laughs> <laughs> the second of July we've got Dunstable, and the sixth of August close. we've got a big show at Stoke. So come along to one of those. Definitely come to Dunstable. Is the, it's going to be the Duncan Jalali show, I think. Oh, it's yeah. Of things. It's coming out, right? Love to watch that. We could definitely get into that. I feel like... Um, he shouted at me last time, told him off. But yeah, it's good. Because yeah. I said he couldn't knock anyone out. And then, he did. And then he knocked someone out. <laughs> it's always good to get proven wrong in that kind of way. Yeah, it's, it's not... Good I'm, for everyone. He's my friend. I'm not disappointed. I'm not like, well, he should have, he should have uh, got us points with him. That's no. the problem. If you have high expectations, right, then nobody really, really needs it. So tomorrow, yeah. tomorrow when I go and co- coach my little kids' jiu-jitsu team, I'm going to try to work my mind and just have low expectations. So if they show up with their belts tied and stuff like that, they're like, oh, way to go. If they can put their right hand on the mat, when I say right hand, they're like, oh, that's amazing. Instead of, yeah, I've been a bit... I think I've been a bit cruel lately. That's the secret to happening, Steve. Low standards. Low, low standards. <laughs> <laughs> standards. I, 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 
learned so much from you. <laughs> My wife's going to listen to this and go, wait a minute. <laughs> um, excuse me. On the um, July card, I'm going to say a fight of the night. It's going to be Reese Teasdale against yes. Lee Anthony. Yeah. Because that is a fantastic fight. It's very similar style. It's very similar experience. And, and you've got someone that's quite good at winding people up and someone that likes to get wound up. So it's kind of... Well, that's it. Both strikers are good grappling as well, good sort of wrestling, and very explosive as well. Yeah. The range, longest fight. What's the X-Factor? Reese is so man? emotional, that's the thing, which is kind of his strength and his weakness all at the same mm. time. That's the X-Factor for Reese. Yeah. yeah. Is, is his, emo- his emotion and what you could almost call swagger, because the, the coolest thing that I remember about Reese Tisdale is when he had you know, his big, big hair up, and he came out and he was almost like pulling up his, his pants, and he was pulling up his shorts, and he get head kicked, and I was like, that's wicked, man. I don't like the whole fake tap try to hit, but you know, you act like pulling yeah. up shorts and kick somebody in the head. That'd be cool. And then you've got um, just the awkwardness of Lee Anthony. Right? Yeah, he's just yeah. an incredibly awkward person to try to grapple, get around. He's got incredibly long legs. It, he's the kind of person that I think you'd describe as having your limbs coming from your eyeballs. He's <laughs> Bill, quite, Bill, I missed a tip, he? he is. Like, and, he's, and, you know, he's obviously gotten a lot, you know, he's been improving. Fencing Jiu Jitsu's now been an elite for yeah. a few years now. It's like I've helped him a bit with his grappling, so. Mm-hmm. He's he perfect about now, isn't he? Do I give him a purple belt? I can't remember. <laughs> Sorry, Lee. He was a sort on Instagram. Yes, yes, of course <laughs> I gave him a purple belt. Oh my god, I'm sure I, could, I'm sure I sent him a message to congratulate him. Yeah, yeah. Good job, Lee Anthony. Everybody just calls him H. No, yeah, quite a, quite a quite a really really good guy. Um, yeah, that's a great fight. And then there's a few good pro fights, and then the, the real main event, <laughs> the Max, co-main event, Max Mordente <laughs> versus Michael Chognacki. Michael coming off a tough lost to Doug Kajabi mm-hmm. and uh, Max coming off a win but he's only one on one going in and this is I hope Michael doesn't listen to this because I'm about to blow smoke up Max's ass like I've never seen someone improve so much and uh, I see footage of him sparring with some of the best guys in the country and doing very well so he should be you know title contender on the battle arena but it's, can he do it under the lights it's the yeah, pressure can you do it under the lights and it, well, you talked about that, that constant improvement. Well, obviously, if he's having to go head-to-head against some of those really, really great fighters, like you say, whether he's sparring at BST or sparring over at RGA Bucks, yeah. that's, uh, you know, you learn a lot from losing. You set higher goals, higher goals all the time. Right? Yeah, yeah. Go from, you know, wanting to be third place to being first place. I think the interesting thing about Max is when he, his first two fights, he was still 17, 18, mm-hmm. and doing A-levels and getting straight A-stars mm-hmm. and managing to fight as well. He couldn't, as much as... He wanted to just focus on the fighting. He had to balance it out. Mm. Whereas now he's had this little six-month gap where he's been off uni. He's between courses, and he's just been training twice, three times a day, seven days a week. To the point where I'm begging him to have a rest day, and he's like, "No." <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and he's turned into absolute monster. He's like, he just tested his body fat, five percent body fat, like fat absolutely guy. shredded, yep. and like he's got some man strength now. Yeah, he's starting to never gets up. tired. So like, yeah. Oh, I'm super biased because he's my student, but I hope I'm realistic about his skill level. And uh, I don't know, you train with him. Yeah, yeah, cool. I do. Um, so I'm with him last night. He was looking pretty good. I haven't rolled with him in a few weeks, but when we did, I'm pretty sure he was taking me down pretty much at will. So he's got Yeah, Mr. Pressure. Wrestling Champion. He's got that, he's got that forward, forward pressure, and yeah. what, what you want to have, right? And honestly, at, at amateur, it's, it's less of a... It's less of a feeling out chess match, I think. I, I, you can always you know, talk about MMA being like a chess match or whatever, a chess game, game of chess. But really, an amateur, it's who gets there fastest with the mostest. Who's yeah. got the gun ready and who's going to fire it? Mm. Right? Because you're not going to have five minutes in the first round to realize, oh, they, you know, did you realize that they drop their, drop, their, drop their jab? Or they reset in this way? Or when they throw a kick, it's like this. Or they look over there first. Or you're hearing the mm. kind of advice that's going on so that you can readjust. Yeah. It's not like that. It's pretty much like an old school know, line up and just let it go. It's who who hits hard first. Yeah. That, that's why it's really that's why I was telling um George Caruana who's fighting on that card as well, who's an absolute legend and you know, probably the hmm. you know, the king of all gingers. Um <laughs> and the champ by the way. Um, I was telling him the other day, I was like he, he, he was he was he was sparring and everything like he that. He wants Fisticuffs kick because of that. No, oh he did. <laughs> He's a man. But he um I'm saying man, you gotta get out there and, and in a fight, you know, you gotta hit him hard pretty early. You gotta give, make him respect you. Yeah, yeah, and definitely. It's really hard to do that when you're sparring your friends. Right? Yep. You don't want to, you know, if you're if you're one of the creases, yeah, you're just gonna fuck anybody up, no problem. Just gonna 
don't really care. They don't, they don't, have, <laughs> empathy. They don't have that. Yeah, that empathy thing. They just well, it's one of the reasons I know that Matt's can fight is because he sparks yeah, with uh, Tom Creasy. <laughs> like, you got no choice. Yeah. <laughs> Tom Creasy's one of the biggest problems in MMA that no one knows about. That's the yeah. thing. That you just the worst thing because it's high risk, low reward. Because someone like that, of that skill level, yeah. without that audience. It's terrifying because that's sort of solid fundamentals. I mean, it's, it's traumatizing sparring with him, but it's fantastic. That's why I think he's got to be a bit more active social media and stuff. Like, just get attention. Like, I think it's important. If you're a professional fighter, you're selling your ability to fight for money, right? So the more people that want to watch you fight, the more mm. money you're going to get paid and the better fights you're going to get. And it's, it's a bit of a weird one because there's like multiple ways of doing that. You can do the GSP thing where everyone loves you and respects you and you're the humble martial artist that way. Uh, or you can do, you know, the Conor McGregor way, but you've got to get attention. It's like, that's what it's about. Fighting is a great way to get attention. Yeah. But when you're fighting on, you know, whether it's Rise of Champions or a lot of these, you know, smaller regional shows, we can talk about Cage Warriors being mm. a national or international body, I guess. Yeah, but I mean, Tom, Tom, Tom's not people out. He should be putting that highlight on social media yeah, just every week. There, there, should, there, <laughs> like, should, there, there have been knockouts and things like that. And you're right, putting, the, putting that in and, and also having some sort of message. Who do you want to fight? Not this, oh, you know, man, like, I'll just fight anybody they put in front of me. <laughs> Fuck that. You know, um, who do you want to get revenge on? Yeah. You know, if I was him and I had an older brother who had been beaten by other people, I'd want to go and beat the shit out of those people. And every and fucking one of them. As guys that do right? interviews pre and post fight, and as a podcaster, mm. there's nothing worse than the generic fighter answers of because it's not personality, and that's yeah. the whole point of these long form conversations. Is yeah. you're more than just your record, more than just what you're portraying. You're a person with your personality. You've got something yeah. about you, and if you're giving off generic, safe, yeah, I could be everyone. Training comes going really well. Yeah, the cut's good. It's like, oh, shut up. Like, just <laughs> you started well. You started well. Yeah, yeah, I can yeah. Beat, now I can beat everyone. Yeah. That guy's talking shit. I want him. Yeah, you know, that, that guy has unfinished business. Yeah, this name means something in this country. Do whatever you have to do. Be tribal. That's what people are gonna, gonna mm. connect with, right? Talk to all the you know Chinese Chinese English folks that, or you know the people yeah. in the Chinese community here in the UK that have all experienced crazy amounts of racism that have all been you know treated in, in a particular way or marginalized by society. Take them all, put them on your back. Don't let that stress and pressure get to you, and just go out and do. It's what like you Mexican want to do. fighters; the mm. whole country yeah. follows them straight Always. away. Look, yeah. at, look at even even what, Cain Velasquez couldn't speak a word of Spanish. <laughs> couldn't speak a fucking word of Spanish. Brown pride across his chest, and everybody loves it. Yeah, right? and then you, and then he has to fight Mexico City and compete. It's, it's quite quite high. Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> we got there like the day before. Just remember to research, you know, your own culture. Every I did experience that one. I went. My my wife's from Mexico, and I went to Mexico City, and there's a really good uh, Henzo Gracie school in a basement with no aircon in Mexico City. So mm -hmm. it's altitude, hot. So I was like, oh, I'm gonna go train. And I was like, for that one round. And I was like, oh my, I'm gonna die. It's mm -hmm. the like, fatigue, isn't it? From like yeah, fatigue. and this is when I was training a lot. And I was like, you know, I could do an hour roll and no problem. And like one round just killed me. And they're all laughing. That might just be a Henzo Gracie thing. Have you been to Henzo's in New York where the desk squad used to be? Yeah, I've been there once, yeah. It's just so hot. It just in hits the basement. You. Yeah. <laughs> no, even you're walking in the top bit, it's horrible. You go down there, it's suffocating. Maybe, How it's you do... Maybe it's a trick, right? Because then everyone is like sweaty and more lubricated. And then when you go to comp and everyone isn't quite so sweaty and lubricated. Maybe there's a theory behind it. Well, I had um, the uh, conditioned nutrition on, and we're talking about um, heat acclimatization yeah. and that sort of training, and basically spending time in the sauna or the hot bath or an hour or whatever it is at a time. And what that starts doing to your body, you start diluting your sweat, so you're losing less electrolytes when you do sweat. Uh -huh. You're sweating at a lower body temperature, and it's staying cool. And that's something that, I can't think who explained it, but basically fighting, a big part of it is staying cool under that pressure. Hmm. And even if literally from a, a temperature point of view, you think about fatigue and when you're getting overwhelmed but if you can actually stay relaxed and relatively like you know you know yeah. sweat and you're breathing you can regulate that pressure a lot better but again it's more of a, a tool to help what you're already doing it's not stop sparring or straight the sword <laughs> but you know it's like a bit of a while you're there it's a nice added thing i believe because uh, i went to matt hughes's gym to do like a camp many years ago and one of the things they would do after training with the protein they had a giant like 30 man sauna and we'd all go in the sauna they pull the whole bucket on the coals mm. and then whoever was coaching the session that day, could be Matt Hughes himself, would just lean on the door and be like, no one's leaving. And like, to the point where the, you wouldn't really sweat anymore, just kind of boil off your skin. Mm. And it was like dick swinging or whatever. And like, but yeah, it kind of makes sense now. It's like, what happens in the sauna stays in the sauna. Oh yeah, it's good. 
You've got to entertain yourself somehow. <laughs> He's in there with Matt Hughes. Oh, God, God that's such a dick. Poor Matt Hughes. <laughs> <laughs> you can't say that about a guy with a traumatic brain injury now. I can't say that. That's what every no, entire fight audience, have surely. Have the, no, I know what happened to him, but like he's still, yeah. he, well, he was a dick, and now he's a poor well, man. We have been talking about how ego is important. <laughs> fight, right? It really is. You know? He screamed like he was a bit of a hero of mine. That's why I went to train with him in his camp, and then he just ended up screaming in my face. I was like, well, this, this hasn't gone well. <laughs> Should be like, like another one, please. <laughs> <laughs> yes, coach. Yes, daddy. Else, what else? <laughs> <my shit? laughs> Man, but I can I can actually under, I can understand Matt Hughes a lot and why he you might have rubbed him a bit the wrong way. No, so a lot for a while, Chris, you did rub me the wrong way, and that's not anything to do with you. It's something to do with where people like Matt Hughes and myself come from. All right? Am I too posh? Is that the problem? A bit, my good fellow. A bit. You see, when you when you've grown up like Matt Hughes, you know, whatever it was, working on farms, shoveling shit and stuff like that, and you work when you grow up in Niagara like I did, working on farms, shoveling shit hoping for a good, better life, you know, you think that you, you grafted everything and absolutely everything and then you graft in wrestling and then, you know, there's, there's no future, there's no money in wrestling, there's nothing, like, what are you going to do? You're going to become an Olympian, you know, a bunch of other guys, you know, we can talk about, oh, I don't even know, want to talk about that, but the issue is that then you, you walk in and somebody like you is coming down, right, you come from a good family, you've had good access your entire life, everything to you, Chris, is an opportunity. Whereas everything to people like Matt Hughes and possibly myself from more working class kind of background is everything is on that kind of knife edge of failure. We know what failure really, really looks like. And not, not the, working not class the, background, not, I just sound not, posh. Not, not, <laughs> not, 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 not the happy. That was a gardener. Not that happy, like, oh, I'm a failed, I can try again kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. safety that kind net. Of, like, yeah. I you know, that. one little step the wrong way and shit just completely goes completely wrong. Unfortunately for Matthews, that's come to fruition. Because it's all your friends, Steve. I didn't know really I'm, really I'm admitting this kind of thing. So, yeah. and it's, not, it's, it's actually from a point of insecurity in myself, right? Thinking that there's I nothing... I thought you just didn't like me because I was better than you. You're also taller, <laughs> you're also taller than me. Taller than me, a bit earlier to it. Right? There's a lot of reasons to dislike you. But that, that was of, the polite reason. That kind of insecurity within yourself is what a lot of people with uh, that kind of chip on their shoulder, they, they go through, right? They, yeah. they see a world that wasn't really made for them. They do some sort of niche sport that they get celebrated for in some way. And then you have imposter syndrome for the rest of your life. Like, what the hell am I doing on this podcast? <laughs> He's criticizing Chris. Though. Yeah, I know. I feel hurt now. I'm not criticizing I'm, I'm just saying, I'm just trying to explain why Matt Hughes might have been a bit like, uh, besides that British accent kind of grates on American folk. I know. Yeah. I do sound posh. I appreciate that. My dad was a landscape guy. I would not like to. But my last name Fenson does come from a line of Norfolk lords. <laughs> yeah, I do. Someone a couple of generations ago blew all the money, but <laughs> we lost it all. Have, have you seen the Last Kingdom? That was actually about his family. That kind of thing. My parents drive a Ford Focus. <laughs> yeah, terrible, terrible. Speaking times. of gardening, how's the thing you're doing? Oh, so my, I met up with an old friend yesterday, this son of a bitch. He came in, he's like, I haven't seen you since your birthday. He's like, Can I, I've got you some presents. Gives me two wrapped presents. Like, oh, that's kind of you. Unwrapped the first one. Health and safety at work for dummies. Right? Mm. He's like, you prick. And I was like, second one, that'd be a nice present. Open it, four boxes of chocolate fingers. Just asshole. <laughs> your producer is laughing. <laughs> Somebody's got a good sense of humor. <laughs> I thought you were going to say gloves. <laughs> Four finger gloves. I thought it would have been. No, nice. the fingerless gloves. Yeah, they're oh, yeah. grabby ones. <laughs> yeah. The glove, yeah, the finger is 9 out of 10, obviously. Yeah, it's all good. I, where's the camera? I, think, I think that's an opportunity. I can do this. this. Look, where's the camera? Yeah. 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 <laughs> so got your the kids out right in, in the ear. Yeah. yeah. It's quite a fun one. When I'm, if I queue somewhere and a kid is like looking, I'm like, huh? Oh, what's up, kid? Yeah, that's it. Then put it up there, you'll lose it. <laughs> we'll do the old thumb trick and then be like, ah, oh, ah, oh. oh. <laughs> it's, not, it's, it's not going to work, it's not going to work. Could act like you're chewing your nails and then, oh no. <laughs> Got me hungry. A little bit too much. No, but I'm going to give this guy some credit, right? So when I did it, I was like, obviously it hurt like fuck, right? So oh, I had this, my kids were there in the house and it's like spurting blood, right? Mm. And like the, the end of my finger sat on the floor and like, it's pretty like traumatic I'm like I kept my shit together like even to the point where I'm like I sat down with my kids and like went daddy's okay I'm coming back don't worry like didn't shout didn't <laughs> scream passed out in the car lost too much blood and I, I was fasting so I had like no blood sugar and then I lost loads of blood and passed out I, but I knew I was passing out so my wife was driving me and I was like just to let you know 
I'm about to pass out because everything's <laughs> going a bit crazy. I was like, I've been choked out before. Feels like that. And I was like, I'll be back in a minute. <laughs> but I sat in the hospital and I was like, the pain is bad. And like, I'm like rationalizing, going, I don't play piano. I don't play guitar. Like, I can still grapple. Everything I love is fine, right? It's like, I can deal with it. It's no problem. But the issue was feeling stupid. Because of my fault, I slipped and it was entirely my fault for not being careful, right? There's no one else to blame. You know, like, it almost felt like it'd be easier to be in an accident where you'd be like, that fucker. Like, I just felt so stupid. And then I wanted to go to Battery the next day and commentate because I was like, why not? Fucking get on with life. And uh, so I phoned Steve going, I can't drive. Can you drive it? Can you drive me? And he's like, yeah. And then on the phone, he's just like, by the way, mate, you're awesome. And he's like, everyone loves you. Like you're, the en- it's like, you're the envy of all men, right? And just flowed my ego. And, like, and everyone else was like phoning, going, you okay, are you going to be all right? And it made me feel more stupid. It actually made it way worse. I was getting more and more pissed off with myself for feeling stupid. And then he was like, you know, you're like, you're awesome. And I was like, that's exactly what I need to hear right now. Like, because the pain is bad, but the hit to my ego is, feels right now, feels worse. And it's quick because you're on pain, like this mm. game pain meds and stuff anyway. So I don't know what's going on. Yeah, so... <laughs> Lost all your fingers. But to your credit, like, you were, you know, you always putting on Instagram, like, all the cool stuff that you're doing in your house. You know, you built that little Harry Potter room for your kids to... <laughs> despite really hating wizards yeah. more. Yeah, despite hating wizards. <laughs> you know, so being, being a bit handy, and I was like, oh, and what, what amazing... You know, the, the original question after he told me I, he cut his finger off was, oh, what amazing thing were you, were you making for your kids? And he was like, I was really just cutting fence posts. <laughs> was yeah, not excited. But, saying, like, <laughs> in the first time in since my daughter was born, that's like nine years ago, the first time someone's made me cry was him being nice to me on the phone. And I sat in the hospital, I was like, fuck, you got me. And I was like, I was so proud of being stoic about the pain. I was sat there and I was like, my, I don't want to upset my wife because this is already horrible for her. She had to carry my finger, <laughs> right? And I was like, I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, Poor Julia. I'm gonna handle this even before payments. I was like, I'm gonna sit here like, and wait for the bus. I'm gonna handle this well because it makes no difference if I shout and scream. Fence Morales. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I, I tried to be a stoic person. It's like an opportunity to test it. But yeah, it's just the, the frustration of feeling stupid and you made better. Good. But that is interesting because initially when someone has some form of loss or defeat or something, some mistake, the instinct reaction is to comfort and try and you know, take the edge off. Yeah. But you don't need to hear that because you already know that you've accepted it, you understand what's going on. It's yeah. like after a, a loss or a fight, you don't want someone to say, oh, don't worry about it. So, it's just a fight. <laughs> I knew yeah. that. I knew that. I was yeah. going to do it. Yeah, yeah. You've got you to hit people um, from a different angle. So some people don't know this. I think I talk about it on our broadcast a lot anyway. I'm a teacher a school teacher by, by trade. I'm a special education teacher, so I work in a SCMH school, which stands for Social Emotional Mental Health. Um, these are the old behavioral schools. So these are the kids without a lot of emotional self-regulation. So, for example, um, we had a kid, and he was in a, a separate room, a safe room that we have, and he's throwing, <laughs> he's kicking the walls, right? And some of them just like, you know, eh, 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 kick. He was actually chambering the kick. Ooh, going good to say. <laughs> so if I was to tell him, stop kicking the wall, he's like, fuck you, so you know, yeah. keep, keep kicking the wall. I was like, no, I, I was like, mate, have you done any martial arts before? Because you're actually chambering that kick really, really well. And he's like, what, what? Actually, no, I've never done martial arts. <laughs> I was like, oh, I was like, really? Because that's how I would show you to do, to do a side kick. You chamber your kick and boom, go up. <laughs> and because I hit him with that, he was just like, all of a sudden, all that kind of anger that I didn't wade into his emotions, right? I didn't wade into your, you know, feeling of, you know, whether it was despair or disappointment or just, you know, being upset with yourself. I didn't wade mm-hmm. into that. I came at you from, Something a bit more, but that's why it's being understood. That's isn't it? The, yeah, I think it's that energy of being understood and being like, okay, you're actually making an effort to connect with me. You're supporting what I'm doing in some way. You're not telling me I'm doing wrong. I'm not fitting in now. You're, oh wait, what I'm doing is correct. I'm being not just praised, but wow. Yeah, you can be appreciated for something. You know, even if you're not, if you haven't done the right thing, there mm-hmm. might be something right. In it. If you can find, if you can find what they're doing right. That's the best thing that you can possibly do to anybody because most people are coming from a place of, of, um, of anxiety or, or low self-esteem in every, in every sort of situation. Even this, this situation right now, we're having a little conversation and everything like that. As long as you keep everything positive, Dan, it's gonna keep coming. But as soon as there's a bit of criticism or somebody shuts up or something lo- gets a little bit low, if we wade into that emotion, we're not gonna have it. Somebody's gotta keep it going. Well, Steve said they didn't used to like me. 
No, it doesn't. Yeah. Like yeah. You. He didn't say you used to. Doesn't. It wasn't I said, previous. I said seven you years of faking it. Rubbed me the wrong way. That's all. But then again, that might have been for like part of your your reputation as well, because you're not you aren't actually how you come off. No. Right. I come off as confident. You come off as confident, even even borderlining on arrogant at times. Yes. But that's not who you actually are. No, I am. Look at this. <laughs> no, look at this whole fucking story. Look at this whole fucking story about how you chopped your finger off, right. how you passed out in the car, and how your mate said something that made you cry. That, that is like, that is like ridiculously open. And yes, we started with like the fact that you're doing a great charity seminar. And you're going to set up set up with like you have these lofty goals. You've got guys that are fighting, and these are all like you know strings to your bow, feathers in your cap. Way to go! You are amazing. But you're also very, very human and very fallible, and you share a lot of that, you know. Hmm. But that's probably things the like second things. or third paragraph of conversation with you. If, any, yeah. if everyone's just focused on the first two things, hi, I'm Chris Benson, I'm a black belt. <laughs> Arrogant prick. No, 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 but hi, no, I'm it's Benson, hi, I'm Chris Benson. Hi, I'm Chris Benson. And I'm a black belt, and I had four kids, yeah. and they were screaming at me, and oh my god, I'm just so happy to be out of the house right now. How are you doing? Right? Nine times out of ten, I don't injure myself. <laughs> that's, a great, that's, a great that's nine out of ten. <laughs> it's nine and a half, isn't it? I went home, my daughter's like, we can do fractions. I was like, you bitch. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. But other people that I've known, birthday, other people that I've known just through a jiu-jitsu context have said the same thing to me. They're like, mm. oh, I thought you were a bit of a prick. And then I got to know you outside of the mat, and I don't think you're a bit of a prick. And I'm like... In that environment, especially at like Kev's, I'm not, I'm not the instructor. I'm not anything. I'm going there to train. And if I go with someone like you, who's like competitive wrestler, very, very good. It's like, I'm going to win, right? Someone else, if I go with a white belt, blue belt, then I'm going to work on stuff. I'm not that guy that smashes everyone. But if I go with someone like you, I do turn the ego on a little bit. And I'm like, and I think sometimes it does rub people up the other wrong way, but also... I like to win. But that's Don't we all like to win? Yeah, we do. <laughs> if, you, if you had none of that in a gym, if you had none of that on a mat, you'd have a bunch of fucking Tai Chi people. That'd be it. Yeah. yeah. There's an ego in wanting a black belt, yeah. isn't there? Like, 100%. You right. wanted to be stroked. You, you know, I, I don't know if I, if I said this anywhere really publicly before, but for, from the time I got my brown belt, and it is a long drive to Aylesbury from Leighton Buzzard. It's half an hour, okay? <laughs> And half an hour after you've rushed to put the kids to bed, made sure you read stories, tried to connect with your wife, tried to make sure you did the dishes, put up with all the shit from a bunch of kids at a behavioral school, and you get in the car and you drive. One of the best things that kept me going, probably from Purple Belt, was practicing my black belt speech in my head. (laughs) On the drive. I'm going to thank these people. And I'm going to say this. I'm going to make sure that I get in this quote, because that's important. And I'm going to make sure I thank these people. Like, it's just, you know, just doing that, going over that in my head every once in a while, just kept me going really does and that's a very egotistical thing mm. because I cannot wait to be standing in front of all my peers something a new piece of a new colored cloth wrapped around my waist <laughs> you know holding up my pajamas and I'm like yes I did this I'm great thank you very much bow out exit stage left yeah right. and he's trying to nogi throw it away or like to one side and then, <laughs> you just go and, and then after you get your black belt everybody just starts starting to nogi anyway right but it's um it was a it was a funny little little exercise, and I think I think imagining yourself in the place you want to be is important. What's well, visualization, then, isn't it? Yeah. And then the next day, yeah. right? Because like I said about the officer world championship thing, shout out to anybody that competed in Ontario. Um, if you just had that, what happens the next day? Yeah. What are you doing the next day? What you know? What's going to keep you going to, going to training? Is it going to be I'm going to try to hit this new technique? Am I going to try to win a tournament? Is it just good for me to keep going? Is it something that balances me? Are there people that I'm pouring myself into, like your Max, the Tooth Mordente, and you know those guys? Do you know that you you going into training or you coaching? He's not called the Tooth. We're not having I like to call him the Tooth. Well, not Max Power. Sense. Max Power. Max, Max Power. Right, you, 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 you be in charge of the nicknames. Then, all right? That's That's right. Right. The Tooth is quite good, but he's got nice teeth. He does. It's dental, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. I understand the part. Make sure I'm sure. The important thing is to be the rub, right? You know, you're rubbing off on people and hopefully it's, it's good for you and you, you leave things a little better than when you found them, right? Other than like how I used to roll up into MMA because back in the day, we talked about basement gyms and stuff like that. Elite Training Center was a basement gym. It was me, it was Sam Creasy, Tom Creasy, and we were kind of like going around fighting everybody. There were a bunch of other guys that, that had fights, and, you know, Ben, ben Gajewski and I think who else was fighting at that time, Glenn Crossland. And we all just went down there. And I remember trying to, like, having done a little bit of MMA in Canada, having done a little bit of BJJ, but not getting too into it. Um, Did you fight Greg Glenn Crossland? 
I did. I yeah, because you were playing in top team. This is a funny, funny story. I'll get to. Yeah, we we fought each other because Research. we went to. We used to go. So we used to go to fucking uh, uh, Jersey, um, Jersey Island, and do Rumble on the Rock in Jersey Island, and we showed up and we were supposed to fight people, and they were like, "Oh, we don't have it. They didn't show up. Do you guys want to fight each other?" And I was like, "All right, cool." <laughs> And, but I really like Glenn. He's a really good. He's a good mate of mine. He was a good mate of mine at the time. But James and Ryan and Ben wound me up like fuck that entire weekend. They're like, oh yeah, we're gonna teach him. You know, he's gonna be able to beat you. He's just gonna have to guillotine you, whatever. And I go out there. And like, <laughs> the first ten seconds of the fight, I throw like some stupid flying, you know, Superman punch yeah. and break his nose. Uh. And then I could feel, I could, everything I was throwing at him for some reason was landing. And I was like, I don't like this anymore. So I took him down, and took his back, and choked him. Mm. But it was like, it was just one of those like again, hall of victory. Yeah. Like beating up somebody that you train with. You instantly feel bad. I felt terrible. I felt, and the worst thing was when we came home on the Sunday, we all went out to All You Can Eat, and his wife and kid came. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> You're mine now. Uh, I own you. <laughs> You're mine now. You're not my wife. You're not my child. <laughs> Come over Come here. here. What are you going to call me, Daddy? <laughs> <laughs> That would, been, that would have been like you know, prick levels over a thousand. Right? Like six, six yes, I won. I won a cage fight in my underwear. Yeah, we love it. <laughs> stripping down to your underpants and fighting another man. There's nothing you know, less homoerotic in the world than that. On that same note, the recent battle <laughs> the man who fought in his pants in the literal. Yes. We need to talk about this because we were on the commentary taking the piss because that's what we should be doing. Well, and job description. Killing yeah. our time. Killing time. Killing time. And uh, and I I I think the idea was mine that he can put his pants over the top of his cup and then fight in his pants. Steve's like brilliant idea. Yeah. Legs it round. Has a little word with them. Two minutes later, plan executed. Fight saved. It started to get me worried because Paul come, Paul Nichols comes in, he starts waving it off. No, uh, Paul Nichols of like glory fame, and I was like, no, 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 we can't like we can't lose a heavyweight fight. Like like a heavyweight fight has to happen. If they're going to fight in the cage, they're going to fight in the parking lot, and then we'll I will lose say all of our crowd. he could have done with tighter underwear. There was some oh aggressive gosh. views for I a certain was, angle. I was, I was waiting for us to have our first little slip up there, that, you know, staring into the abyss at one point, but. Mm. And he won! He in his did. pants! You he don't mean North South in that, do you? No. I think we need to talk about the Sombo team that came with like uh, six fighters. The Tajikistanis. Yeah, so they, they came and they were like supposed to be these Sombo monsters. monsters. I was they, judging it on their ears, they had good messed up ears. They did like, have good messed up ears. But, and I was trying to point this out <laughs> so earlier in the, in the broadcast, Sombo, those guys wear gi, you know, gi jackets most of the time. Yeah, All yeah, those grips are gone, right? Pretty much. And a lot of the tightness. And I know we celebrate, we're like, oh yeah, Khabib, Khabib, Sombo. Khabib's a freestyle wrestler, really, mm. really. Yeah. Right? If, if we look at what made him successful in MMA, yes, it's a mixture of like Sambo ground techniques, but also a lot of wrestling to get you there, freestyle wrestling. So, yeah, Sambo, do you still think this, pretending. Do you think the Sambo bit is, like Jiu Jitsu is focused Mystique. on holding you down, but for the purpose of a submission, whereas like Combat Sambo is like holding you down for the purpose of being able to hit you. It's, yeah. like, it's like technical ground and pound, kind of. Yeah, they can they can do that element, isn't it? So it's it's just Legalist another positions. It's, yeah, it's just another piece of of that. It's the origin and the purpose, isn't it? Like judo was initially done so they can arrest people. You take them down and you pin them for some yeah. reason, like arrest them and take them. So how farmers used to think protect people from like licking their crops and things like that. Mm. I think I've heard that Joe Rogan probably isn't true, but it's interesting. It sounds <laughs> quite good. What's Aikido from? Nonsense. Nonsense. <laughs> Crackers in the park. Wrist locks are coming back, buddy. They're yeah. like they're the shit. I'm just looking at everyone at the moment. There's a great book about uh, Aikido um, called uh, Angry White. Angry White Pajamas. Pajamas. I like that book. <laughs> By Robert, Robert Twigger, I think. Yeah, so. And he like trains, and he's, he's like shitting on judo in it. And yeah. he's like, and then, and then they're they getting a street fight in it, and he uses Aikido. No, he did, in, in the one street fight, <laughs> the street fight where they, they all go out, so all these Aikido guys that are all getting their black belts, and they're doing like the, the Japanese, the, the, the Tokyo riot SWAT, police? The, the yeah. riot SWAT police training, right? And they had to spend like weeks just training on their knees so their knees are all raw. Anyway, so they go to the pungi to get like fucking hammered. And they all get drunk and they all get in fights. And instead of using their Aikido, they all end up grappling. <laughs> just wow. throwing people to the ground and stuff. And I was like, yeah, that's what, that's what ends up working. That's what wins the day. Grappling, the base for everything. Simple shit. Most people can take at least one punch, you know? And then you close the distance and start smashing people up. Yeah. yeah that's, that's the way forward. And then everyone goes, oh, grappling wouldn't work against multiple attackers. I'm like, I don't think anything works against multiple attackers. That's the issue. Yeah, especially in this country, because you're going to get stabbed. Yeah, well, in America, you're going to get shot. It's like yeah. everywhere. 
in Canada, they're just going to pour maple syrup on you and be Pretty like, sticky. could you fight a little harder, eh? Come on, man. See, the dad doesn't know how good he's got it. He's the next generation after us. Oh, where there's like, there's so gyms good. like BST and whatever. You don't have to like travel all over the country. To oh, I've got it. Good. One instructor. Like, used to hear Dan Charles' podcast with like Tom Barlow, and I'm trying to up to Birmingham, trying to Bradley down south. Yeah, that was me. And started yeah, those sort of like hours and hours. Of, like, half an hour drive to Northampton is getting a bit much. It's <laughs> <laughs> almost two pound a litre. It is almost two pound a litre right now. It's brutal. I, yeah. say, I say it when I like go, if I go teach a test seminar somewhere, I say to people it's like that. You know, when I started out, it was an hour's drive to do an hour's class mm. each way. So it was two hours driving for an hour's class. And I'm like, you know, you're in late and buzzard. This gym is down the road from all of you. Like, realize how lucky you are. Use it. Like, take advantage of it. Yeah, it's not just the mat. It's all the all the experience that's come with it. All these people mm-hmm. that, you know, for absolutely nothing. They, there was really no hope of ever making it in MMA when I was fighting. Like, it was like, no. even even if you, even if you did, you know, win a UFC championship or something like that, a lot of those guys weren't making loads of money. There wasn't no. like the McGregor effect mm-hmm. or anything. There was nothing promised. It was like literally for love of the game, right? It was for love of something to do to keep yourself fairly focused or to do things that people are always saying, oh, I wish I could have done that. But, you know, when you've gone out and done it. But at that time too, you also didn't get this real push for the dream. Mm. So like people, mm. people win battle arena titles now and then they turn pro and they, you know, they go to the bigger shows whether they go to Bellator or like the Kelsas. Yeah, there's, there's some career pathing there and there's a really good level of coaching. They've, they've seen, you know, we've had a crop of people come through that have, you know, had various successes and, and failures. Um, but when I was doing it, like I was still working full time. I was actually really surprised. I told Elliot this. I was like, "Did you know that Fensum took like months off while he was training for his fights and stuff like that?" That's yeah. what he told me. He told me he was taking months off of work while he was fighting. What was I doing? I that freaking bruised teacher documentary that that, that <laughs> my mate Lee Malone literally showed up that day. I was teaching full classes, you know, up until the Friday. Weighed in on the Saturday, fought on the Sunday, every single week, all the time, right? And when you talk about like. Now it's way worse because we got the stresses of families and like, yeah, and, and like the seriousness of life. But man, the stress of teaching, you know. Yeah, I mean, my ambition like, wasn't really my ambition wasn't to get in the UFC. It was to do what I do right now. It's to mm-hmm. teach, but compete on the way so that I can I've got something to teach. Exactly. So like investing a month to train here, there, and travel, and go to Brazil and America and Japan, and it seemed like it was worth the effort. See, that's something that's so cool about you. <laughs> because like you decided oh I'm going to do this shit I am I'm cool. going to do this stuff so, right? I'm just going to so I used this. to rub up the wrong way now I'm the yeah, cool no, no, no. <laughs> it's, 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 it's an evolution but that, that's so cool that you decided and you were like alright so these are the building blocks and like I'm going to have this experience now and that experience is going to help to inform how I'm going to teach in the future right whereas people like myself and Matt Hughes have to have plan B's right like, no, like, yeah, but like, I mean, I was in a position where I, instead of going to university, I decided to do martial arts full time. It's the opposite, isn't it? My you parents, haven't got a plan B. That's kind of why you make it work. Yeah. It? yeah, yeah. My That's parents said it was a saying. stupid mm-hmm. idea. It made me pay rent if I wanted to stay at mm-hmm. home. Mm-hmm. And like every trip I did, I self funded. Mm-hmm. And it's like, yeah, I don't, I don't, I feel like I, I came, I did it, I my borrow my bootstraps a little bit. Yeah. I think, <laughs> I, think, I, think, I think that kind of mentality is really, really important. And it's something that, um, is definitely different between myself and like the, those other two fellows I named like Sam and Tom have gone off to be pro now yeah. Sam with a huge amount of success Cage Warriors champion despite how much Cage Warriors wants to try to shit on him all the time <laughs> um, and but they've, you, done, they've done so so very well but you you don't do that on your own really there's a no. whole team of people around you that are making various sacrifices if you have a spouse that spouse is making sacrifices for well, you. even your kids making sacrifices your kids sacrificing are, time. Kid, you're sacrificing time with your kids you're sacrificing you know, your health long term as well there's a, there's a lot that goes into that and unfortunately a person like me who like you know just, I, I don't really pro and con stuff but if I just get the wrong kind of feeling or I don't think this is going to work out in the long term it kind of pushes me away mm. and maybe that's like kind of my upbringing because you know, the idea of being an Olympian in freestyle wrestling was very, very attractive at 17, 18 years old. But then also knowing that to win, a, win you know, if you win the Canada Cup or you won the Canadian Senior Wrestling Championships, it was worth something like $4,000. Yeah. It was worth absolutely shit, nothing. Mm. And that's your whole life. Right. That's what you're doing, right? And a lot, you know, I was part of a very, very good university team that, you know, a lot of people did really, really well. A bunch of Olympians, people medaled and so forth. Um, but, you know, it's wanting what you've got, right? You made certain, there's only decisions you made and decisions you didn't make. And I get to wake up every single morning and know that I'm making a positive difference in the world through education. And you get to wake up every single morning and know that you're gonna make people feel good through martial arts and your understanding and your 
knowledge that you've you've spread along the line. And I just do that part time. You get to it all the time. Yeah. yeah, but you get to teach as well. Like, you know, it's special uh, needs man, kids, that's so rewarding. I get to try to drag special needs kids through Macbeth. <laughs> See, that, to me, that sounds like the worst special. thing in the world, but you know. People are, like, there's only so long I can set it up. People are going to fucking die, you know? And we get to watch the, we get to watch the movie in six weeks. <laughs> six, six weeks. <laughs> Once you understand promise. what a soliloquy is. Anybody soliloquy, know, please? It's just when they speak to the audience and show their... I just speak posh, don't know posh things. I know. I sound like I've got a high IQ. Mm, it's <laughs> Try not to veer this into Shakespeare for you. But it's, it's a choice you make. You know, there's only choices you make and choices you didn't. And actually, I can bring Macbeth into this. He goes oh, off. Macbeth, I'll wait for that. Macbeth makes the wrong wrong choice in Macbeth, right? He 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 corrupts himself morally, and he spends the rest of the the play regretting his decision until he at the very end he's like, "Well, I made the bad decision anyway. They're standing out there ready to kill me." It's time to die with harness on our back. Give me, ar- give me my armor. Armor, armor. That's what he says. Give me my armor, even though he doesn't need it. And they're in the castle, and he's like, "No, we'll go out and fight them," right? because he's just like he's, you know, he's accepted that he's going to go to hell. That's a quick synopsis. It is a quick synopsis. <laughs> it is a quick synopsis, and it connects to what we're doing here, like the idea that you just have to decide. Yeah. If that's if that's the path, that's the path. Start with the choice. Know, mm. Stand me in my job, like you brought up you know, before the broadcast. It was like the know, guy, the man. The, yeah. The, <laughs> yeah. He's, he's the man, isn't he? He wants to inspire people, fights yep. to inspire, as Chris always says. But you know, whether he's working at Nando's, taking buses, places, he's... he's but that's inspiring. It's that like, is inspiring. You don't have to be Conor McGregor on TV. You can, you can no. just be living a normal life and inspire people. You can do. And something you touched on before is about being a jack of all trades in the current like, climate of people just chopping and changing loads of small projects, not committing fully to something. I think that fear of taking the wrong path is a really sincere problem a lot of people have. I've suffered yeah. with that as well, where it's... Do I make sure you really go in this basket? Is it longevity in this? But I feel that indecision is causing far more issues where you've got bits here and there. You're not committing anywhere. You're at a roundabout. We're not going in any direction. Mm. And I think having that confidence just to commit your direction at least for X amount of time having that kind of plan. Like say with your teaching plan. I mean, that's perfect. I mean, the way people had their fight careers, that's how the story ended up. Mm. It's almost a good blueprint. And the way you sort of made yours up, mm. deciding that sort of template, like, I want to do it this way, do this, that and the other. It's not too dissimilar, but you have to commit to that. You can't get to Japan at this point and think, nah. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm also a realist. Like, I, I got to, I had the opportunity to train some amazing people. And I think you, as much as maybe I do have an uh, ego on the mat, I can also be realistic about when I don't, I, I'm not up to standard. And there'd be certain people I train with and I'd be like, oh, I'm never going to be him. I could do, I could train full time, take all the drugs in the world. I will never be that guy. And I still love this sport, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> but and I'm like, so, I don't think maybe that's something fighters need to look at as well, where they struggle at the end of their careers. Because there's some guys that become amateur champions mm. and they're Ooh. not gonna, and they possibly shouldn't go pro. That should be the end of their career. And there's guys that go pro and like, knowing when you've reached your peak, it's like a good point. Because I, I like, for me, I felt like titles on the level of Battle Arena at the time, it's a much higher level now. I thought, I felt like that was as much as I can do. Because I was in the gym with pros and I was like, I'm not as good as them. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a tough pill to swallow. But if you can do it, then you can have a plan B. Right? Well, and then teaching was never really my plan B, it was kind of plan A. I was like, that's a much better career path than getting hit in the head. And at the time, we, we, were, we were fighting, there was no money. Mm. Like, even the pro pros were getting underground to fight. It's like, you know, that's amazing, but that's, you've got to get the UFC main event to get that. So you're not getting that. And what, like, when Chuck Liddell and Ortiz were fighting, what the undercard guy's getting, like, mm. two and two or something. It's like, it's just, it wasn't a career. So, yeah, I think just realistic about career aspirations. I was speaking to another battle from Molly, Lin- Molly Lindsay about yeah, this awesome. sort of concept. And the thing about accepting ordinary. And yeah. the idea you're so surrounded by all these top outliers and all these different worlds. You've got Jordan Burroughs of wrestling, Chris Benson of jiu-jitsu, you know, yes. this, that, and the other. Do you think? <laughs> That's what I'd say. <laughs> like red outliers. A big part of that is the time invested at 10,000 hours, pretty yeah, yeah. things like that. How are you going to invest that much time in more than one thing? And all these other people, and all these areas, especially MMA, when you're trying to look at the individual specialists, the absolute top tiers, this style of that, this style of this. There's no wonder you're trying to change this, trying to work on that, trying to work on the other. Then the longevity in it, the balancing out, there's so many different things. I mean, this is almost a bit of a leading question, but I know what it's going to be. <laughs> so when, if, say if you're an O&O pro, you've amateur champion, da, 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 you're starting off medium sort of hype, 
What is your part of the UFC? Is it still Cage Warriors? Yeah, Cage Warriors Academy, Cage Warriors Show. The issue is, I mean, it's one promoter and you're then at the whim of his bias. Mm. And he, he becomes a manager when guys go pro. So is he putting certain guys forward because he's going to represent them as opposed to someone else that's represented by someone else? And it becomes a bit political, I think. But I mean, there's still a route. Like, in, in my mind, the, the route is easy. Doing it's hard, but the route is mm. amateur, battle arena, ideally. Pro battle arena, and then Cage Warriors Academy, Cage Warriors, UFC, and Champ of the World. Just every one of the steps is pretty fucking <laughs> difficult. But like, now there's a route, right? Mm. <laughs> And people have pretty much done that route, so... That's only if the Americans are interested in us. Right? If the Americans are interested yeah, in marketing. what Cage Warrior is, is offering, then, then all well and good, then UFC is the way to go. If the Americans are more interested in what's happening in Bellator on the regional scene, then that's the way to go. Even if you have to go to the, the PFL or whatever in the meantime. Mm. And like you said, the management and whether certain people are being put forward is important. And we're all really up to the whim of... And I say as Americans, but it's also the East and it's mostly the United States, right? Is that's what's going to buy into you, mm. right? And yeah. And you get a couple of, you know, you get a, a fast talking scouser like Patty Pimblett, he shoots to the top of popularity or at least of what is perceived popularity. And then they'll treat you right and they'll pad you with a few, mm. you know, less than, you know, contenders type of fighters. And you can, you know, get a couple wins under your belt. Yeah. Other fighters, they just feed to the dogs. And it depends on what weight class you are and whether there's any, any eyes or any ears on that. Right? I think if you got, you know, a, if you took one of our, our rugby players and you taught them how to fight a little bit and you made them a big heavyweight star, they'd pick them up like that, mm. you know? Yeah. Like guys, like, guys like Sam and Tom who are in the lighter weight, weight divisions, they don't get picked up as easily, right? It's not, it's, you know, especially flyweight, right? There's not, there's not tons. And unfortunately, this is the moment where I get to turn a little bit. Ooh. <laughs> so now about creeping in the negative. I guess I'm talking. All right. It's all going to so get horribly about, wrong now. You talk about management, Chris, and you talk about the way to manage and bring up fighters appropriately. And you think about management of, of something like Cage Warriors. And something I was very, very disappointed in. As in December, um, Longshanks Luke was able to talk himself into a, into a title fight for the flyweight um, title of Cage Warriors against Sam Creasy. He talked himself into it by saying there was a phantom tap in their first fight, which anybody could have explained away as Sam bringing his hands together to defend an armbar. Anyway, somehow, somehow, this fight ends up happening and coming to fruition, and Luke Shanks again doesn't make weight. So he didn't make weight for the first fight. He never he makes weight, does he? He didn't make the weight for the second fight. He made weight this, this last fight. Oh, he, okay. he actually was really, really good. Okay. Really, really good in the, in the bantamweight division, which is great where he belongs. He's but your boy, he, isn't he? Mr. He's BST. Yeah, yeah. He's starting yeah. BST. Which oh. is great. He had a good win over Josh Reed as well recently. What, one, and a half, one and a half liters he had in his body. He had three, he missed by, weight by three pounds. Sam made weight. And, and the lighter weight That's is a huge, huge amount. It's percentage, isn't it? And then Sam gets, gets TKO'd. Right, and we talk still about the fluid, yeah, but we talk about fluid on the brain. So now the the championship is delegitimized. De we have a loss going to a, to a fighter who easily could have been it could crack the top fifteen in the UFC. You've mismanaged him, mm. and you had two other guys in the same weight class fighting in the lower part, part of the card. Just bump them up, right? It's 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 mismanaging stuff, and it was something that I that I blamed um, our own corner for. I thought that should have been dealt with appropriately. It's one thing to be able to fight professionally and be able to throw a really good Superman punch or a high kick or execute a twister or whatever to a very, very high level. That's great. But you could have the best fighter in the world if he doesn't have the right management behind him, the right coaches, the right people that are actually looking out for him. And I explained this to, to Will Haycox, his father. I was like, man, I don't know Joe Sell Cummings at all, but if he is somebody that wants things for your son, then he's the guy for the job. Yeah. Unless you want some things from him. And everybody seems to have their fucking hand out. They want, they want selfies. They want you to, they want you to, to you know, you know, sport their stuff. They want everything. They've got their hands out constantly. It's very hard. It's like a diamond in the rough to find people that want things for you. That manager that wants things for you. You belong here. This is the kind of exposure you deserve. And I'm sure they talk a lot with that kind of, that kind of lingo. But getting somebody that's actually going to go through it, that's going to understand you as a human being. What are your goals? What is your lifestyle like? What kind of responsibilities do you have in it, and how is that going to be realized? Because putting you, you up against a guy who cuts a lot of weight anyway while he's a kilo and a half over, you know, and you're, you're over 30, you've, you know, it's, it's, it's a tough thing to... For it's hard to as a corner swallow. man, though, to be... Because you, you, your not, fight is so confident. Corner, I'm not blaming the corner now. Yeah. I'm blaming the fucking management. Yeah. Like, whoever's managing you. 
and whoever's thinking, oh, well, we've got this, we've got this pro who's really, really good. He's got the fucking look, doesn't he? He's got the look. And if Sam had beat him, no one would be even thinking about it. You know? No, nobody would be. There's but a lot of things. About it. Paul Rimmer speaks about this. About um, it's about the fights you don't take and things like saving a fight from themselves. Normally you hear it of a, uh, I'll fight anyone. And says, well, you wouldn't, because then you'd fight him, Garnet, and you wouldn't. And you, yeah, because he's giant. <laughs> and you know, fight anyone anytime, yeah. And he'd squish uh, it. You want to fight someone your way, your level, but you're slightly better than in front of loads of people, make loads of money. Unless it's that, you're not happy with it. Yeah. So that's not anyone anytime. That's the right person, at the right time. Someone like Sam, who's very, you know, honourable and respectful in a martial arts point of view, wants to, you know, honour, if he thinks there's been any kind of, you know, uncertainty, wants to make sure that's right, you know, he's not going to be the one to step away for that alone. So at that point, it's a case of saving the fight from himself with these sort of decisions. But like we said there, if he then lands the shot or gets the guillotine again or whatever happens, we don't have this conversation. It's risk versus reward, though. Mm. If you could see that it was all stacking up against him, that's your job. You have power of attorney, essentially. Mm. You two love that rash card. You can't, I do, I really like it. You, you can't, you can't look scared. to somebody and be like, you know, <laughs> if you get me fired up enough, you cut my cut weight, and you're like, Steve, do you want to fight? I'd be like, yeah, who? Anybody, sure. Yeah, and you, you, you want to fight all anybody. that dieting, Just all that meat. prep. Right, whereas it's, it takes a really, really strong relationship to be like, actually, no, this is, like you're saying, this is not right for us. Well, like saying no is just like skill. That it's like, it's hard to acquire. Which I don't, I don't have. Super important. Yeah. Myself, George Hardwick, who's fighting yeah. for the lightweight title on Cage Warriors soon, he was on the podcast fairly recently, and he was saying that saying no to a fight is almost like you've accepted a loss. Mm. And the only time he said no is because of the um, last minute pull out. I think it was like the cold COVID thing. Yeah. Everybody had a really last minute. Fight made no sense. Saying no to a fight that made no sense still eats him up because it's one of those things he's taken it as on principle alone to fight. If I've said no, it means I've not, I didn't think I could beat you. Or because you need reason. confidence, and, mm. but I think. Is he fighting tomorrow night? No, um, Harry is. Harry's fighting um, Frederica Pasquale, I think. Okay. That's why it's usually your team. Your manager should tell, say, I know you could beat him, but mm. it's not a great matchup. It's not good for your career. So your, your ego's safe. Your psychological health is safe. I'll and it's on someone one. else. Yeah, my management did it. Yeah. So I wanted to fight him, but my, my and boss And then you go on the podcast yeah. tours and you explain why you didn't take that fight and how somebody's not a You're like, I was desperate to fight him, but my, I'm, I'm my team I'm, wouldn't let me. I'm, I'm, <laughs> this, I'm this weight division's professional. I'm this weight division's champion. I'm not bantamweight division's champion. I'm sorry, right? If you want to give me both belts, fucking cool. You can do that. And then let me be 135 pounds. That's cool, but not having it. And when you're, when you're from the bottom anyway, you know, when you're coming up, when you're never, this never should have fucking happened to you. You know, you never should have put X and Y together. You know, Steve Brinkman should not have rolled down the gym in 2010 and shown you guys a little bit of wrestling that you guys were able to implement into a game. And then Rich Miller, <laughs> Richard Miller coming in and being one of the best Thai boxing coaches around. You just, you know, it's, and then on top of that, we had a really good SNC coach there at the time, and we just had the drive to do it. And Sam's mom did my laundry for an entire year. <laughs> my, my mother-in-law, she was a wonderful, wonderful person, but that was definitely performance-enhancing. You know, I didn't need performance-enhancing <laughs> drugs. I had performance-enhancing mom. You know, and she is like literally, she's the best kept secret in MMA. She's a person that's always got food for you, always ready to, to watch the kids for you, and always ready to help you out with something like that. And that's, it's a family thing. It's everybody coming together. Mm. And that's a wonderful thing. But you put all that on your back when you go into the cage and you fight, mm. right? Which is a hard thing to, to give up. And I just would love for our, and this is, you know, what I alluded to, um, I'd love for Cage Warriors to function more as a, you know, accepting its role, like I think Battle Arena has, or certain gyms should. If you're an amateur gym, you send your boys to professional gyms when they go professional. You don't hold on to them mm. and say, oh no, no, they will never know you. Like, you mean come down, man, you run a class, whatever, we'll pay you, cool. Yeah. Let's do that, let's push you towards the professional gyms, let's push you to the professional height. And if Cage Warriors, like we're saying, is just like European, or really compared to the American, mm. the other, the sub-American promotions, it's really a regional title, even though we've got 60 million people here. Mm. which is loads of us in a proud fighting, fighting tradition. We, it's fairly regional in its approach. So if it's going to be a feeder for the UFC, why don't we have that? You know, why don't we have like a Premier League championship? Mm. You know, why don't we have Or it's a feeder for the contender series. For the contender, yeah. which, is, which I thought was a bit of a slap. Because it was Hadley, mm. right? Hadley went yeah. to the contenders and I was like, oh, come on, man. Come on. That's just, that's almost, that again is devaluing the titles that people have won in Cage Warriors. Well, there's loads of people like um, Justin Burlinson, he fought in contenders, lost that, and then come back. He's fighting McKee for the title yeah. this weekend. Yeah. Mm. There's a lot of those sort of come things. Yeah. And contender series is a very strange dynamic because I almost explain it as like a golden buzzer from Brinkley Talent to so straight in the final. You, 
Yeah. Literally. Yeah. It's so strange. And, uh, I don't know. It's just, it's just something they added in to get rid of. But they still have tough going on. It's literally just tough. It's so weird. weird. It's I fast, would, tough. You get road to UFC, road all sorts of oh, this is This is my idea, but I don't think it'll ever be picked up. I think you should do, you know, like, and I was a big WWE fan back in the day, so take it with a grain of salt, but I think you should do continental champions. Yeah, yeah. I think you should have a fucking European champion, North American champion, South American mm. champion, Asian champion, Australian and more, champion, and more weight divisions as well. Yeah, well, and like you can dilute it like that if you want to, but they would. I think they would have to. I think they'd have to shuffle them. Rather it's, it's than, exciting rather than if it's like, the European champion versus the yeah. Asian champion or whatever. Then it's it exciting. like boxing, though, isn't it? Then it's you can have a world, a world yeah. uh, Grand Prix champion or something. You could do it every couple of years if you want to make it like, or every four years or something like that. Do it like a World Cup of fighting. And that would be so interesting and dynamic because what people want to do is they want to connect themselves with a fighter. Mm. And you, you know, we could, we could do that so easily by having these fighters fight often. You know, it doesn't have to be on Fight Pass because who fucking watches Fight Pass? No. You know, we talked about this with Cage Warriors last week and I would love to see Cage Warriors on BBC2 mm. or, you know, ITV or whatever and just be like, yeah, yeah. look at that. It's not enough exposure for That's a local guy, you know? That's a guy I can just, and he's at this gym just down there. I can go and I can support and I can do this. And people would get behind that more and we'd have more access to it. But instead, people have all got their hands out, and they just wanting to take the money off of the top, and it doesn't actually benefit the fighters. Hmm. And that's, you know, from that, you know, cue ball fellow that runs the UFC to hmm. every single promoter that's out there, except for James Price, because he's the man. He's the man. But they have a risk versus reward, and they want, that. they want their payment, too. And it's time for the working man. The working man. Talk to the working man. Dan, when are you fighting again? Yes. Wow, that's a question. Come on. Well, that's it's a big announcement, the snip. <laughs> and the answer is when I'm ready. And the reason I'm saying that is I feel I've been rushed by my own self and my own ego. I feel that yeah. I started wanting to compete because my friends were asking me, when, when are you going to fight? And I rushed myself. Yeah. And I've had fights that were winnable, but mentally, physically, whatever blocks I've been dealing with, I wasn't in a position to perform to my best. And instead of me just getting the next one because I'm getting asked, is I've got my plan for how I'm training, what I'm focusing on, and when the time's right, the time will be right. Because yeah. otherwise, I'm just rushing in on a lot. Obviously, it's all to chance and the day has to say the right. But I want to go in knowing in myself I am confident, I feel ready. No, I feel I should be ready. Yeah, so and I'm there's a 100% no rush. Mm. It's like there's no reason to do it at ASAP. Follow up question Which area of your game would you improve the most? Let's say I gave you like 10 experience points. You can throw it at kickboxing, boxing, wrestling, jujitsu, more wrestling, whatever. Blending. 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 Oh, Blending. oh, so you want to be able to mix, you want to be able to... I want to, the thing is, the individual that's detail... That's the BST thing, is blending. The detail of the individual techniques and things like that, that's not been the issue of, I can listen to this, I can practice this, crack on it, okay, I'm under pressure now, I'll do it individually, but making it smooth in that transition, not the clunky... Mm. The panic shooting and just the ground and pound things like that it's the fluidity of blending and just the mm. composure under that pressure I think that's where the real practice is because outside of just rinse and repeat of practice okay I can do the pads I can do the technique it's I'm under pressure do I still hold form do I still make it look smooth did I intend to set that up or did I just panic shooting and play it out mm. things like that it's the consistency of it I want my worst to still be sustainable at a good level not highs and lows I want at least a consistent I think your awareness of that like shows a lot of maturity as well. There's a lot of people who don't realise that. That's you might be like, too smart, dude. That's the problem. Yeah. Yeah. You're Luke too Shanks smart. used to say it to me. To, to, to quote Luke Shanks was, "You're scared of your coconut getting cracked." Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> me, me, and, me and Luke Shanks actually agree on something. Shout out Luke Shanks. Man. He's so funny. Yeah, isn't he? I will talk a lot of shit about. I like Luke Shanks. I think he's hilarious. He must be a really, really nice guy. And he's obviously friends with you. But the whole blending thing. So how do we make that happen? How do you make that happen, right? Obviously, you can spar at BST and get hit. Some people just don't like getting hit, man. That's completely understandable. They That's why I want to blend so I can not get hit as much. <laughs> the, the, the only reason I knew I was ready to fight, um, and honestly, Sam and I used to like just go at it with four ounce clubs back in the day. I remember him fucking clunking me really hard on the eye, and I had a parents' evening that night. I'd go into like, I'd go into like fucking really. Mid- I'm just like, giving him bed. I was teaching middle class like Cedars Upper School and Leighton Buzzard kind of thing, just sitting there watching my eye get more and more as these people that just got off the train from London were asking like how I was going to get the levels of their kids up but the only reason I knew I was ready to fight uh, as a grappler you don't like getting hit in the face anyway mm. was that you could take a couple you wouldn't blink and it would almost feel good yeah mm. be feeling got nice, you going you know like eating a steak kind of thing yeah that's, it's like a that's, that's what you gotta do man you gotta eat somebody's liver and I think that will help you 
The thing is, I've had that inspiring a few times. The thing that's is, a really big jump, sorry. <laughs> I think a lot of it... Killer man. That's the thing that's, I heard the other day, we'll wrap this up soon. Just keep, sorry. Keep, no, it's sorry. one of those things. Ryan yeah. Holiday was on Joe Rogan yesterday. He's good. Eh? Fantastic Amazing. listen. Yeah. Really enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah, yeah he's uh, uh, obstacles oh, the way. Hell. <laughs> but one thing he was, there was talking about, standard Joe Rogan stuff, is one is one thing having dealt with you know high pressure under the sort of tension. That stuff. skinny little prick has dealt with anything. No, but what I'm saying is, is one thing having done that in the past, but it doesn't mean you're still conditioned now. It's like saying it used to be in shape, it used to be these things. This is why your post resonated with me a lot more. It's not you know oh I've had people blowing smoke in my ass to start the podcast. You know friendly to a lot of people, technical with a few bits and bobs. Oh you're the man, you're the man. So get smoke up my ass. I'm like, oh I'll be fine. I need to spar as much. I need to do this as much. Take your foot off the gas, you start losing more rounds, you start using your ego, it's like, oh, just playing around, just being technical. No, no, I'm losing. Yeah. And I'm justifying it. It's not the same yeah. thing. And I need to go through the fire again. If you're one of those things of just appreciating the white belt mentality of starting again, yeah. as if it was from scratch. So that's what I'm doing now, essentially. It's, you know, getting the foundation from a fitness point of view, from a functional movement, things like this, getting those competitions in, getting the sparring in. As if I'm trying to prove myself to myself and the coaches again that I'm ready to fight, not just oh, I've done it before, I'll just do it again, I'll just get in shape and then fight. It's not the same thing. And I think just taking that honesty of when I'm in there, I need to be cool in my own head, my own pressure for my own self, not just, oh, there's a show coming up, there's an opportunity to. Because I used to do that all the time. It used to be, there's an event coming up, you know, I've got eight, six, however long weeks, low everyone's going to be on it, I'll put a good camp in mentally. The preparation side, you know, you think, oh, I'll just train three times a day, I'll run before or after work, I'll do all this, da 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 the Tuesday of that first week is the longest day ever. Like, Christ, that Monday was tough. I thought I was rocking. These eggs are disgusting. I don't like it anymore. This roided Russian man's going to murder me. Yep, yep. And it's just, I don't know, slowing things down and doing it consistently. Because this is something, a mistake I've fallen into many a time, where you're doing loads of things at an early stage. And it's easy to maintain them because it's the white belt stage. You're understanding basic principles, you're doing this, but you're not investing time to build a game to trial and error, to really learn and invest. You're just, oh, do a bit of this, play the guitar, couple of the notes here, okay, cool. I'll read a few pages of this book. Mm. But that compound growth is one thing, but the development's another thing. You need to invest that time, focus, be proper, otherwise you're just going through the motions, mindlessly. You must see it with the kids when people revise. It's, you're reading the same book, but you've not applied this knowledge you're trying to learn. You're just regurgitating it. It's point. consistency over time, like you're saying, and that consistency allows for improvement. Um, Get to shout out Daniel Lewis. Um, Dan Lewis just won um, the British Open in, in uh, Black Belt in the Gi, which he loves. And just before he was going out there, I caught him. We have competition training every, every Sunday. Had his shirt off, and he was looking absolutely ripped. I talked to his girlfriend, Caroline. I was like, Have a go. He's looking with the sword. Like, no homo or anything, but like, he's looking great. Um, I know, honestly, I didn't mean to say that. But whatever. Anyway, but Caroline. I figured uh, saying that Caroline, you Caroline was just like <laughs> Caroline was like, yeah, he's just been really consistent. You know, at times where he would have like backed off on his training, or he would have allowed himself to have like a cheat week or whatever, he just hasn't. He's yeah. just stayed very, very focused. And part of that is like losses at um, you know the European Masters and things mm. like that. So those kind of drove his fire. But those those are opportunities for us to be like, oh, just get fat and eat burgers because I lost. I'm obviously shit. But he didn't. He always had that goal in mind, and that's that consistency. The only time I've ever won anything of any sort of value has been because of consistency, and I think he hit it really, really well on the head there. And just getting into your own mind that you're actually ready to go, and that this is the kind of Dan Lester that wants to go out and fight. This is the version of it. For me, I just kind of created a character for myself, just an angry chip on the shoulder guy that could strip down his underwear and fight. You know, take off the suit and tie. Get in there and fight. Right? Jeff Glover, Metamorphs kind of energy. That's an old <laughs> to me. Always. There you go. I've got the Socratic know yourself thing going on. That's good. That's like wisdom coming through with age. Because one thing I've appreciated through doing this is one being scared and insecure and everything else to then getting a bit good and thinking you're really good. Mm. So I go from I'm scared, ergo I need to be more confident, so I then become arrogant. Yeah. But that's not the same thing and appreciating, okay, I need to. I've made some progress. It's the Carl Jung thing, a little bit of knowledge is a dangerous thing because you start yeah. expecting the world to be. You think, I know jiu-jitsu. I thought I knew jiu-jitsu when I was a two-stripe white belt. I learned the scissors. Oh, we all did. We I all thought I was a like, man. Yeah, I, th- that's it. I was Daniel's son. I still am. <laughs> <laughs> wax on, wax off. Um, before we wrap up, a couple of things. First thing to remind everyone. Some Ch- charity event, midday, 10th of September. Come along. All for a good cause. Loads of the 
best instructors in the country, 25 plus, including me and Steve. And regards of training, where can people see you, man? Oh, just want to see my logo. Uh, if you'd like to come train with me. <laughs> so, uh, we've got uh, Fencing Jiu Jitsu in Tame in Oxfordshire, a little village. Uh, also in Abingdon in Oxfordshire, at Can Do Martial Arts, and then also Elite Training Centre in Leighton Buzzard. So, you've got three options. And uh, you can come and do some Fencing Jiu Jitsu, which is basically normal Jiu Jitsu but with more wrist locks and heel. Which people prison like. rules. Yeah, prison rules. Prison rules. <laughs> <laughs> this is another conversation. We're going to go into this very briefly. In <laughs> sub only matches, oil check should be legal. It's a submission. I don't care if you don't like it, you need to find an escape. I think this should be encouraged. Or <laughs> <laughs> like orifice. <laughs> I think if you can't exactly. defend it, you're not, not exactly. oil check. That's a fish yeah, well, yeah, but fish hooks, if oil checks are allowed, then fish hooks have to be allowed. It's the whole thing. gouging. It's like small yeah. drug manipulation. If you can't defend it, Whose problem's that? Do you ever do the butt drag? Do the... If, I, if I can't control the turtle and it's sweat, you know, you've got to keep them down. You can That's the reason you signed up for Jiu Jitsu, Dad. Let's be honest. Yeah. You're like, sort of put a fingers in a man's anus. I didn't realize it was a martial arts I got a belt. <laughs> <laughs> just a Saturday night thing. I thought, oh, it's sick. I just want to inappropriately touch <laughs> someone. I was a skill to it. I thought it was just, you follow the energy. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> just a. Room for the very capable rapists. We know. People say Jiu-Jitsu is gay. I was like, bro, if you turn right, I can stop you. Well, exactly. Who's raping who? I would have, but I could. That's how you get cancelled, boys. I love a pajama wrestling. It's everywhere. <laughs> All right, it's weird, isn't it? I spend much more time touching other men than women. Or life. <laughs> <laughs> Stick to what you know, old habits and everything else. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's what it is. Everything else I can just say right now is going to get me cancelled, so I'll just... Yeah, and then the 2nd of July, Dunstable, Battle Arena. Go to battlearena.com, buy tickets, and the 6th of August in Stoke. Absolutely stacked cards. Possibly the best cards we're ever going to have. So make sure you're there, and bring all your mates along. And I and will come say... Come say hi, come say hi. We'll be, you know, yeah, yeah, you'll see me and Steve happens. wander around. I'd love to say hello to you. In the intermission, if you ask nicely, I can always sneak you in. People, I get people to take selfies in the cage. It's become a thing I do now. Mm. If I see children in the crowd, I just take them in the cage so they can have a selfie. <laughs> just don't take parents. The last show, this poor child was horrified. He's like, that's real blood. I'm like, oh yeah, it is real yeah. blood. <laughs> Sorry about that. You're a little bit, don't you? Yeah, for, for 30 quid, you couldn't spend a better Saturday night. And like, there's yeah. loads and loads and loads of fights and up-and-comers. Especially, like again, Duncan Jalali from... Um, Prime MMA. Prime, Prime MMA. Yeah. Jesus Murphy. Sorry, Sammy Lever. But yeah, from Prime MMA in Dunstable, it's a hometown show. If you're in the area, if you're from Bedfordshire, if you're from Milton Keynes, if you're from the area, get in there, support yeah. these these guys because they really, really do need your help. Know. Some of them sell t-shirts as well. And I'll say, like, you know, a, a UFC ticket is 300 quid and you're miles and away some, yeah. or more. You, get, you don't get a good view. You're basically watching a big screen and you can kind of see some blokes over there. You come to a local show, you're supporting local fighters, especially you buy the tickets off them. They get a little bit of kickback of money. Mm -hmm. um, you're supporting local fighters on a local show, and every 30 quid ticket, you're going to be within 20 meters of the cage. Yeah. Like, you'll get sweated you'll get on. There's so much to be said for it. get a great view. If you think about one being at a live event, seeing people fighting in front of you, but actually allowed to, not just about to separate. <laughs> That's an experience in itself if you've not been there before. Oh, yeah, yeah. But one thing with Battle Arena especially is to see the growth of an individual fighter, you see their yeah. career, see them grow. You don't know who's going to be the next science, maybe in Edwards, Jordan Michenko, yeah. all these people yeah. who've started at the amateur scene and now the world stage and things like that. You don't know who's going to be who, but these amazing moments like the guy fighting in his pants. Yeah. yeah. Me cornering someone on an hour's notice. Yeah. <laughs> no, an hour's notice, five minutes notice. But things like that, last minute pop ups, you never know what's going to happen. And you get the absolute barn burner fights, prodigies, prospects and everything. Um, so regards to social media, fencing Jiu Jitsu, can Knucklehead or from the brink, which one's the... Oh, do, do the uh, can Knucklehead one, C-A-N dot Knucklehead. Um, that's the one that's like open. The other one's just like pictures of my kids and stuff like that for my family. So yeah, and then, thank you for having us on the podcast, Dan. Yeah, like, absolutely really appreciate it. I love to get in and just hang out with Steve. That's quite that's good. That's what we're here for. Camera's not even on. I'm just disappointed we didn't drive up together. I wish we would have. We have some of the best conversations in the car. It's getting a different direction. Yeah. It gets very gay very quickly. That's what jujitsu is for, bro. No eye contact. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> No. Right. And it's Pride Month as well, so shout out to the LGBT. Shout out to Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you to our sponsors, the English Hypnotist. So when it comes to sponsoring like the podcast anyway, it's so appreciated when it comes to any kind of growing promotion, any kind of starting project. That support is so important. 
And when it comes to the mental side of preparation, with fighting, competition, with everything, it's just a fundamental part of someone's game. It can make or break a lot of people. It's definitely been a huge factor with me. And working with it, Richard Hartley, English Hypnotist, has been game changing. And thank you to Stuart and Nigel at Purple Media for making this podcast possible. Could he hypnotise you to stop low checking people? No one can do that. That's <laughs> 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 just, just fundamental. That's instinctual. All right, it's worth a shot. Yeah. You don't tell us not to, you know, shake his hip. You don't, you don't, you t- take away what makes it what it is. The music's not everyone comes for, but you stay for the. <laughs> You know, just don't keep your socks on, you know, you've got to keep it personal, you've got to enjoy things. <laughs> um, on that note, uh, available stream platform, you've probably heard it there. If you want any fisticuffs kit, drop me a message. And Fensum Jiu Jitsu. I don't sell kit, I was just giving you one. <laughs> He's going to take it back to the camera. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Cheers, buddy. Thank you.